Hello, welcome to the good world. I'm Seth, that's Charlie. We're gonna see where this goes. Cause who knows? Hey, that kind of rhymes. Sometimes I make accidental rhymes. Sometimes I make accidental songs. Last week, I was, I did a whole Dr. Seuss thing for Susie about nachos. I don't, I don't remember it. <laughs> Sorry. That's the problem with improvisation, you know? It's, uh, it's there one moment and then it's gone. Everything is ephemeral. Life is death. <laughs> Sorry. I don't really know. It's, it's quite a place to start out this morning. Yeah, I know, Charlie. I know. You want to just be at the park. Um... Yeah, I mean, you know, we don't we don't have to like think about death all the time, but you know, life is life is happening in in the current moment, and if uh, you're always focused on something that's happening down the road or something that happened in the past, then um, you're gonna miss what's going on in the moment. Um, that is called mindfulness, which is a thing I have been trying to practice, but it is hard. And it's so easy to get distracted from the present moment by uh, all of the media that we have, which is designed to keep you... It's not just to keep you from thinking about the present moment, it is designed to relieve you of thinking about the present moment, right? Like, it's the... I, so much of our media is just about distracting you from your own life, uh, and whether that's... It's, it's interesting because that applies to both things that are uplifting or funny, um, but it also applies to things like the news, which uh, distract you from your own life by telling you about how horrible things are for uh, other people all around you. Um, and that, that's not to say that those things aren't horrible or aren't worth uh, recognition, although the way that the news treats things that are horrible tends to amplify them and sort of be about... Um, you know, just retaining your attention. I guess, the, so, uh, if it's not obvious, I did not come into today with a, like, very specific plan of what I wanted to talk about. I had some ideas that I was thinking about earlier. I also have, uh, I did not go to it, though I thought about going to it. I do have a, uh, a list of topics that have, like, popped into my head that, you know, if I wake up in the morning and I don't have something to talk about, um, I can refer to it and be like, oh, that's an idea I had at some point. Um, haven't gone to it yet because there's just always stuff going on in here and coming out of here. This is the right, right, uh, hand motion. Uh, for those listening on the podcast, I'm doing the, like, you know, point at your head and make a circle with your index finger cuckoo, cuckoo gesture. Um, which is both an accurate description of the fact that my brain is just like constantly churning. Um, and also, uh, maybe I'm a little, maybe I'm a little cuckoo. That's okay. We're all a little cuckoo. How could we not be cuckoo in <laughs> this world? Um, so yeah, there are, there are like a couple of things sort of uh, embedded in, in the things I've been talking about. I know, Charlie, I know you really don't like it when I talk to ghosts. That's what Charlie thinks is happening, because he doesn't understand technology or, like, video or anything. Um, so he thinks I'm talking to a ghost. Uh, and, and he finds that very disconcerting. I know, beeps. I know. Yeah, we're almost at the wind machine road. And then you can enjoy that, and then eventually we'll be at the park. Yeah, there you go. Wind machine. Um, so, yeah, the, th the sort of, I don't know, couple, I, let's, let's see if I can figure out how to connect these two things that I am thinking about this morning. Um, so let's, let's start with what I was just talking about, which is the way that the news media amplifies um, things to be angry about. Um, and again, that's not to say those things aren't worth being angry, um, but what, what I am trying to do with this show is give a more representative balance of like, yeah, the world has a lot of terrible stuff and it also has a lot of good stuff and we're just gonna kind of try to acknowledge all of it at once. Hello. Uh, 
but also that's like my life, which is definitely a lot more charmed than a lot of other people's. Um, anyway, a, a thing that I've been thinking about a bunch recently, and it's sort of, um, you can definitely see it all over the internet, um, particularly on social media, but it's also true in more traditional media like TV uh, and print, um, which is the, the monetization of outrage. Um, a, a thing that is, uh, I don't know, that's complicated about the way that our brains work. I mean, if you've, if you've been watching this show, you know that I think a lot about sort of the, the biases that are built into our brains and like the, the, the ways that social psychology can help us understand those things and, uh, and, and try to overcome them. Um, but because our brains are wired to detect threats, um, they are prone to outrage, right? Like outrage for that reason gives you more of an adrenaline hit than, uh, than something like happy and peaceful. Um, you know, getting, getting angry about something terrible that happened in the world re sticks in your brain more than smelling a pretty flower. Uh, fragrant and pretty flower. Um, so you end up, you know, because, because it is a thing that sticks in your brain, your brain is like, oh, that was a feeling. Let's, let's get more of that feeling. Cause it doesn't necessarily understand that like actually in the long run, that feeling might be harmful, especially if it is just flowing constantly. Um, what our, what our brains really do is just learn to repeat anything that we do. So, like, it's, it just, anything we do will snowball by us doing it, if we are doing it mindlessly, as opposed to mindfully. Um, and part of the idea of mindfulness is that, you know, we're, we're making these choices, as opposed to just letting our brains do what they're going to do, because often when we let our brains do what they're going to do, they, we just end up with a lot of really bad habits. Um, unhealthy habits. Bad is... Bad is too vague a term. I don't really, I'm trying to get away from using the words good and bad because they just, it's, it, it's too vague. And you know, if, if we use bad to mean harmful to other people versus unhealthy for ourselves versus like, you know, a TV show that is supposed to be entertaining and is not entertaining. Like all of those are different concepts and, uh, and the one word bad does not actually do a good job of summing any of them up. Anyway, so what happens with our brains is that we get, we get addicted to the feeling of, of defensiveness because that is, that is our brain basically just relying on the structures that it built to keep us safe in the wilderness. Uh, and your brain thought, Oh, if I'm feeling defensive all the time, that must be because there are lions all around trying to eat me, and so I need to be constantly on the lookout for threats. Um, and in our modern world, that is mostly not the case. I mean, even... Look, I do not mean to discount the, the absolute horror of living in... Uh, living in any kind of war zone, whether that's, you know, national war or, like drug wars or, or any kind of violent, uh, environment is extremely damaging. And, and I don't want to downplay the trauma of that, but it's also the case that just like statistically speaking, most of the people who live in that environment will not have a violent act done to them. Probably pretty likely that it will happen to someone they know. Um, but you know, you're not for the most part, like the number of people who are actually being directly hurt by violence is relatively small. Again, that's not to say that it is not a real problem, but your brain, when it hears about these things, puts itself on super high alert because, again, your brain is doing the, 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 the thing that it learned to do on the savannah, which is keep you safe from lions. And... So the way that the news has evolved, I mean, even, I'm not even talking about modern cable news, like going back, nightly news has always been a lot more focused on things like crime. I mean, how, how stereotypical is it that, you know, you'll, 
Oop, that person tried to jump the gun a little at that stop sign. Um, how stereotypical is it that uh, that you'll watch the nightly news? Not that I watch a lot of nightly news at, at this point in my life, but you know the stereotype is like there was a murder, there was a robbery, there was a different murder, there is a flesh-eating virus. Oh, and here's a squirrel on some water skis, right? Like that's that's what the news does, and that formula exists not because it is representative of what's happening in your environment, but because all of the scary things will keep your attention. Uh, and then, you know, they can send you out on a high note with the squirrel on the water skis. And what that does is it gets, uh, that whole cycle gets you to keep coming back and keep watching again and again. And that way, uh, the people who own the media company can be more profitable. Because everything in our society uh, is determined by whether it is profitable for someone or not. Um, and that's... That's really kind of a problem. Like, if you really want to look at the source of all of the corruption and uh, and just the poisonous environment in our society, the fact that we are just letting everything be determined by profit is a really big problem. Because, as in this example, our, our brains, we love to think that we are rational people. All of us really love the idea that we have the ability to reason and think something through and make rational, informed decisions. And here's the thing, we do have that ability, we just don't use it nearly as much as we think we do. There's, you know, there's the, the, the famous myth that humans only use whatever, 10% of our brains, 5% of our brains, 2%, whatever it is. It's not, it's not true, it's, it's a myth, so the number doesn't really matter, but it is, it is probably true, and I say this without, like, knowing of specific research about this, but just knowing a lot of social psych research, um, that most of what we are doing is not actually using the rational thinking part of our brain. It's using, it's using the lizard part of our brain. Um, there's some... The, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of good research I could talk about, um, but... Uh, uh, Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky uh, are a couple of famous psychologists um, who won a Nobel Prize in economics. I think I've talked about them on, on here before. Um, they developed a theory called prospect theory, which is basically about how instead of thinking about our, uh, our status, our situation, whatever, in overall terms, you know, instead of thinking about, if we are high status, instead of thinking about the fact that we are high status, we are only thinking about ourselves relative to anyone we interact with. So if we interact with someone who is higher status than us, it still like makes us extremely jealous, even if we're super, super high status. Um, and so they, they have found all kinds of different biases and they generally refer to the structure of, of our thought processes. I know, Charlie, I know. Charlie, you can't climb over the front seat while I'm driving. I know, I know, we're almost there, buddy. Um, so the, the framework that Kahneman and Tversky have is uh, system one and system two. System one is the part of your brain that reacts, and system two is the part of your brain that thinks. And a lot of what they show is that a lot of the times that we think we are using system two, the thinking part, we are actually underneath it using system one. Um, and we will do that in ways that we don't even realize because as I've talked about a lot of times, your brain is lazy. My brain is also lazy. All of our brains are lazy, but laziness can be overcome. It just takes practice and it takes, uh, and, and it's not, you know, a one-time thing. It would be really nice to take a single brain pill and then everything's better, but it's harder than that. You have to work at it every day for a long period of time. You don't have to work at it a lot and you start off easy, right? Like I meditate for 10 minutes at a time. You don't need to start with 10 minutes. You can start with one minute. Start with something you know you can do and then it becomes easier to level up. You're not gonna, you're not gonna start anything at level 100. Um, but practice is how you overcome the part of your brain that just reacts. And 
the problem with relying so heavily on profit, you know, I think markets can be very useful. I think profit is not necessarily a bad thing. Wealth is not necessarily a bad thing. I do think isolated, hoarded wealth uh, and hoarding resources when there is so much to go around is not great and makes the world worse. But the problem with relying so heavily on profit is that it monetizes our instincts to stop thinking, right? Instead of, instead of letting humans make the rational choices we are capable of making, our profiteering, and especially profiteering media, relies really heavily on, uh, on the fact that your, your brain is going to get sucked in by the outrage, by the fear, by the, by the threat, and the, the perception of threat, because that has always been the most important thing from a survival standpoint. And, and, and what your brain doesn't realize is that watching the news does nothing to help you survive, right? Like your brain thinks that this is the most important thing you can do to keep yourself alive, because every time you watch it, you get you get that rush of adrenaline, and it's like, oh, okay, I need this to survive. But that's not, you don't. You don't need the news, you don't need Twitter, you don't need Facebook, you don't need all of the things that are gonna make you extremely angry to survive. If you wanna choose them, then that's your choice, but understand that your brain is trying to hook you on them, and that that is a thing you at least need to be aware of. All right, we just got to the dog park. Charlie is beepy. We'll be back in a bit. Hi, just a reminder that if you are liking what you are seeing, uh, to smoosh the like button and squoosh the subscribe button uh, and put things in the comments and the, the things. Thanks. Hi, welcome back. Uh, so today's, <laughs> today got uh, a little mixed up for me because I... Uh, after the dog park, I ended up uh, getting a phone call and had a lovely conversation, uh, but that occurred during the course of my drive home, which means I didn't record the drive home. Um, I think that's fine. Uh, so we're just we're just gonna go basically from here uh, into the meditation. But I'll um, I'll talk a little bit more. Um, well, no, I don't have a whole lot else to say about. Um, about what I was talking about earlier. Um, I do... <sighs> something that I think is is just sort of worth saying, because today um, uh, was an emotional day in the news, as most days are emotional days in the news, and um, this does actually, I guess, build off of what I was saying earlier with, you know, you don't, you don't have to get sucked into it, but sometimes there are things that sort of uh, command national attention, global attention, regional attention, your attention. Um, and I wish that we lived in a country where we could have justice without retribution. Uh, I think retribution is the least good form of justice. Um, I think of uh, in in the things that happened today, I think the justice was um, was the recognition of uh, of real harm, right? And just the acknowledgement of that um, from a system that so often comes up with excuses to to hand wave it away um, is really powerful. And I and I think that is a big step, um, and and it's a reason to be. I don't know, celebration doesn't necessarily feel right, but it's a, it's a reason for gratitude. Um, unfortunately, we live in a society where that gratitude and that justice has to, there, the option that we have is to have that come hand in hand um, with retribution and with sort of propping up an individual as a scapegoat for a systemic failure. Um, and it, it is my view that as long as the system is directing us towards individuals, it is often keeping us from fighting it. It's, don't get me wrong, it's possible to do both, and, I, and I, um, I'm not you know, going to scold anyone for, for sort of taking the approach to justice that feels right to you. Um, uh, I don't like scolding people in general. Who the hell am I to scold anyone? But um, I wish... I wish we could... And I think we can 
with work and with time and with practice and with patience, um, get to a point where, um, where we are changing the system and we are not treating punishment and retribution against an individual who is very much a product of that system, um, as a substitution for changing the system. And, uh, you know, we can, we can convict as many, uh, as many people as we want and the system will keep churning out the same problem over and over far faster than we can put people in prison. Um, and putting everyone in prison is a terrible outcome. Um, and so what I am feeling right now is I am holding both of these things. I am feeling, um, relief and gratitude that, that some measure of recognition, um, that, that this is not how things are supposed to work, that, um, that our police forces who are ostensibly around to protect us, um, should not be killing the people that they are trying to protect, um, that they are ostensibly supposed to protect. Um, I am grateful for the recognition that that is not a thing that should be happening. Um, I am deeply sad that the only way that we can do that is through a mechanism of, of retribution. And that's not, you know, this is, this is not the only case in which I feel that, but I think, uh, I think if we're going to apply that metric, we need to apply it to everyone, even if we understandably and correctly think the things that they have done are horrible. Um, you know, I'm, there's, there's, uh, there's very little evidence that punishment does anything effective. Um, and it's, I think one of the things that I am most trying to do with this show is, um, is sort of dry distinction between things that feel like solutions to problems and things that feel like progress, um, and things that actually solve problems. Um, because I don't, I, I, I think as long as we get drawn by our brains and our narratives and, and all of the things that are built into us that we've inherited, um, I think as long as those things draw us to solutions that feel good, um, in lieu of things that require, you know, a little more emotional labor, um, but that will ultimately serve everyone better. Um, I don't think we can, we can make a lot of change until we get there. And so that's, um, those are the conflicting feelings that I'm holding today. And, uh, you know, at life, I talk about this a lot, but life throws conflicting feelings at us a lot. And, um, and it's important to hold both of them. Um, because otherwise you're just telling yourself a story uh, and dismissing part of your actual experience. <sighs> Completely unrelated. <laughs> um, on my call that I uh, had earlier, one realization that I came to... Um, so we were, we were sort of talking about, you know, this, this show and what I'm trying to do here, um, and something that I haven't shared... Uh, on camera yet is that I am applying to Divinity School, um, which I'm very excited about. It's a, it's a non-denominational, or not, sorry, it's not non-denominational, it's interfaith, they are different things. Um, it is an interfaith Divinity School. Um, and I'm really excited because it is, um, so it's online and it's like correspondence based and you just do it all at your own pace and it is exactly the kind of thing um, that I was raised to look down my nose at. And, um, I'm very excited because I, I think it will expose me both to a lot of really interesting and valuable wisdom that I haven't engaged with before. It will also, uh, introduce me to things that, or reintroduce me to things I have seen before, but force me to engage with them in a new way. And it'll expose me to a, um, community. I'll, it'll, it'll give me access to a community that, um, that I'm very much, um, hopefully, uh, looking to, to become a part of. Um, but, uh, part of the conversation I had earlier today is that, um, I understand that from the outside, leaving my stable career and starting a YouTube channel and going to online divinity school seems crazy, <laughs> right? Like there is no question that what I, I, this is way the fuck out there. And it's, it's certainly not something I ever envisioned for myself. Um, and so I think a lot of people who, uh, who have known me for whether it's a few years or longer, um, are 
surprised, confused. You know, I was talking to a friend last weekend and, and she asked me, so are, are you happy? Um, and I said, I am happy. It's, you know, there's a bit of, um, there's a bit of like anxiety and uncertainty because I'm, I'm very much at the beginning of this path, but I feel like it is taking me somewhere good, even though I don't know where, um, where it's going to take me. I don't really know what the journey is going to look like. And I certainly don't know the destination. Um, but I'm, I am happy and excited to be on the path, but I've, there's also some anxiety that comes with all of that. Um, but you don't know, this is, this is a friend who I've talked to about a lot of this stuff and we worked together in politics for a while. And, and she was just kind of like, cause you know, cause from where I said, what you're doing seems crazy. Um, and she's right. It's totally crazy. Um, but it is, uh, it, it, it comes from my experience and it is, um, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not doing it without, and there's some measure of rashness, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of thought and contemplation that's sort of taken me here. And a lot of, um, a lot of seeing what I've been doing and how it works and how it doesn't work. Um, so I'm uh, the part of the conversation that I had with Matt earlier today was, um, he said, you know, it's basically like, uh, I have spent a lot of my time, um, sorry, I'm being confusing with my first person and third person, me, Seth, uh, I have spent a lot of my time, you know, trying, trying to do good and trying to be happy. Um, and I have gone down a number of roads that I get to a certain point and I'm like, you know, this isn't making me happy. And it feels like it's actually not really getting, uh, making much progress. Um, and so why am I, why continue to beat my head against the wall? Um, that's what my experience working in politics was like. Um, and so this feels like it is a different path towards the, the goals that have always been my goals, um, which are just to sort of make things a little better for the people around me. Um, and, and to try to shape the world that I think we all deserve to live in. Um, but what's funny is that not only does it look crazy from the outside, what it very literally is, is a midlife crisis, right? Like I am, this is, I, I get it. This is a midlife crisis. I'm, I turned 39 in two days. Uh, and instead of getting a convertible, uh, or, or whatever it is that someone might do, I am, uh, I am trying to choose a path that will make me happy. That's what I'm doing with my midlife crisis. And I feel like that's okay. Um, you know, instead of trying to fill the void with stuff and more and more stuff, which is the thing I've spent a lot of time in my life doing, I'm just trying to fill the void with me. Um, and the, so I don't know, you know, we'll see. Um, but this feels, this feels like a good path and a good journey and we'll sort of see where it goes. Um, but yes, you, you are watching me have a midlife crisis and I'm, I'm not above admitting that. Um, but I'm, I'm human. <laughs> That's the thing that happens. You get to a point in your life and you're just like, what am I doing? Uh, and yeah, and you can either try to, try to squish that feeling and really tamp it down or you can just try to try to make a shift uh so here i am making a shift um all right let's do some meditation um the meditations may be going away if you have opinions on that please feel free to leave them in the comments but i'm um i'm talking to some potential consultants to help me figure out what to do with this channel and sort of how to grow it and um and things like that not you know, and it's a weird position to be in because I don't really care about the me aspect of, or like growing my brand or anything like that. But the message is really important to me. And that's, that's how you get it out there. I think in this system. Um, but I, uh, one of the consultants I am talking to suggested that, um, uh, the meditations might be a place that I lose audience members. So, Hey, let me know if, if that's happening. I think probably what I will do if they don't become a part of the main video is that I'll just also have separate meditation videos that people can participate in or not. Um, anyway, for the moment, it's all part of the same one thing. Um, so I guess what I'll do is I'll like take a quick break here and then I'll come back and then, then, then we'll, then we'll meditate. Okay, great. Uh, see you soon. Please like and subscribe. 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 
Okay, hi, we're back. We're gonna do some meditation. Uh, so, usual spiel. Uh, you're gonna hear this sound. That's the, the Kongza bell, according to this app. Um, that sound's gonna happen. Uh, 10 minutes later, it's gonna happen again, and that's how you'll know it's over. Um, and in between what I'm gonna do and what I invite you to do along with me is I'm just gonna sit still with my hands in my lap, and my eyes closed, and I'm gonna breathe. Uh, and I'm just going to try to keep my attention on my breath. And so every time I breathe in, I'm going to think to myself, I follow my breath all the way in. And every time I breathe out, I'm going to think to myself, I follow my breath all the way out. And invariably, my mind will wander, uh, and it will get however far it gets. And uh, eventually, when it's wandering, I will realize, oh, my mind is wandering and I'm supposed to be meditating. And so... Uh, you know, without anger or judgment or, or anything, I will just, I will just come right back to where I was. Don't even need an extra thought. It's just, oh, I've drifted. I follow my breath all the way in, follow my breath all the way in. That's all it is. Um, and if you, yeah, if you want to join me, please do so. Uh, if you're doing something, uh, where you can't join me, that's totally fine. I would encourage you to, to sort of take 10 minutes to, um, to just be alone with your thoughts. I think that is good for all of us to do. Um, it's, it's just helpful as a way to relax your brain and, and whatever you're doing, you can try to do that mindfully. If you're chopping vegetables, you can think, you know, breathing in, I chop this carrot, breathing out, I chop this carrot or whatever. Um, and that's it. That's what we're going to do. Okay. Uh, I'm going to hit the start button here on this app. It's counting down from 15. And in, now it's 10 seconds, the bell's gonna go. Man, my beard is floofy. All right, uh, I'll see you soon.
Okay, that was nice. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you later. Bye. Well, it's the garden at my house. Susie, Susie is the gardener. I'm very much an apprentice. Um, so when we moved here last summer, this is an artichoke plant. Uh, I love artichokes. They are, they are a favorite food of mine for sure. Um, but when we got here, these flowers were, were sticking out, right? And so these flowers are now the dried up remnants. You can see the back that that's, that's an artichoke, right? That's the thing you eat when you eat an artichoke. If you don't pick it, it just turns into this big old flower and it's beautiful and purple and, and all kinds of stuff. So this has dried out across the entire winter. Um, but the other day I did a fun little thing completely unintentionally. I'm just going to try to record this for you. Uh, so, you know, these, all, all of these things sticking out here are the, uh, the, some people call it the feather or the feathery choke, but it's, it's the part on the inside of the artichoke. Um, but if you pull at it, Look at that. Those, if I can get this to focus, those are artichoke seeds. Focus. Focus. No, don't focus on me. Well, I'm holding a seed. This is really, this is not a one-hand job. Oh, phrasing. Okay, there it is. That's an artichoke seed. See? Artichoke seed. There's the camera. Uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. And the feathery stuff is what enables it to fly on the wind like a dandelion. Uh, so there you go. Artichokes and how they reproduce. Plants are crazy. <laughs>